um, seven o'clock. So um, I'm going to start the meeting. As y'all can see, I am not Tony and the Shield. I am Bisa Martin. Um, sort of her, her backup on this. Tony Ann sends her greetings and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, uh, Tony Ann's husband, Tom, is having some medical procedures. And so Tony Ann is with him. And so uh, as she told me, she said, prayers are welcome for his health and uh, well-being. But uh, she wanted us to continue on and she'll, she will be back with us um, as soon as you can. Um, but I want to thank everybody for uh, coming on this morning and continuing to uh, work to pass election integrity in, in Texas. I know that there's several of the Democrats that have returned to the House. Uh, I've heard that some of them have returned because there was some block blocking going on in their districts. <laughs> So everyone that participated in, in notifying the voters that uh, their state representatives were actually in D.C., uh, that's great. Great work with all of that. Um, so we're getting really co close to uh, having the quorum, and um, it'd be really exciting to finally get representation as they were elected back in the Capitol. Uh, I don't know, did uh, Senator Hughes had... Are you on, Senator Hughes? Good morning. Yes, I am. Would you please give us an update with what's going on in the Senate? I'd be glad to. Thank you so much. Good morning. I know everybody has a lot going on, and uh, what you're doing is working. It is making a difference. And, and uh, over in the Senate, uh, of course, we, we do have a quorum. During the last uh, special session, we had some of our Democrats leave, but we still had enough to conduct business. And this time in this uh, special session, all of our Democrats stayed uh, in the Senate. And so uh, the election integrity bill, Senate Bill 1, I'm really thankful to be the author of that bill. Uh, we got that bill passed. Uh, we also passed the social media censorship to give folks, get you free speech to make sure you can get back online when Facebook tries to discriminate against you. We got that passed. Also, the 13th check for our retired teachers to help for uh, children in foster care bond reform so that violent criminals aren't turned loose by, by well, just by judges who are just acting unwisely, turning violent criminals loose on personal recognizance bonds. And, of course, uh, property tax relief uh, and some other items like that. We get all of those bills passed that the governor put on the call. And so we're in a in a, a pattern now where we're uh, waiting to our, for our friends in the house. Uh, we know, as you said, they're getting close, and I'm sure we'll get a good report from our, our house members on the call. Uh, the election integrity bill, Senate Bill One, uh, passed again. Had a good debate. Had a very good debate on that bill, and the bill continues to get a little bit better as as we go through the process. We uh, added a couple of things in the bill to make it easier for our military personnel who are overseas when they vote by mail, easier for them to use that process. We also made some changes to make it easier for people who have disabilities. And so we're encouraged about that. And of course, the heart of the bill is, is still very much easy to vote, hard to cheat. Uh, we have the protection for working people now where if your work schedule does not allow you to get off work during early voting, your employer has to let you off. And if you're in line, when the polls close, maybe you got there kind of late and the line was really long. But if you're in line when the polls close, you must be allowed to vote. Both of those protections we have in place for Election Day, but you've never had that protection in Texas uh, during early voting until now. That's in Senate Bill 1. We're encouraged about that. And, of course, 24-hour voting, that experiment tried by Harris County um, is not uh, is going to be clearly a uh, uh, taken away because it was never provided for in the election code. The law doesn't say you can do that. No one in the country that we can find had ever even tried that. Um, we, again, we did make those changes I described to make it easier for folks with a difficult schedule to vote. We're also expanding in-person early voting uh, during between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., also weekend hours. We're doing everything we can to make it easier to vote, uh, to vote properly, legally, uh, one person, one vote. We are for that. This bill uh, cracks down 
on those ballot harvesters, those paid political operatives who try to get they try to get in between the voter and her ballot. They try to coerce voters to mislead them, sometimes literally to steal ballots, to forge documents. Uh, we are cracking down on those folks because the right to vote is too precious and it costs too much. It's a blood bought right. You know that. And so we have to protect it. We have to secure it. Also making sure that uh, we have cameras, we have live stream recordings now in central counting. Uh, originally in the bill we had last session, we had this live stream uh, video recording of central counting only in counties with population over 100,000. In Senate Bill 1, in this session, we have removed that bracket. So from the smallest county to the largest, we'll be having that same protection put in place. So again, the folks on this call are familiar with the bill. They're common sense reforms. I think I shared with you last time, I had the opportunity to meet with some state legislators around the country who carried uh, election reform bills there. Um, and we compared notes to see what was going on. Many of those states are still trying to pass voter ID. Many of those states uh, have universal voting by mail where everyone gets a ballot by mail. So they have real problems that, that lead to fraud. And so Texas is in much better shape. We are, we are leading the country already. And once Senate Bill 1 is passed, uh, we're going to be in good shape. There's always going to be tweaks, always going to be work to do. But we're encouraged about the way things are going. And um, speaking of voter ID, Senate Bill 1 will give us voter ID for mail ballots uh, for the first time in Texas. So a lot of good things in the bill that we're encouraged about, making sure our poll watchers are allowed to do their jobs. Poll watchers, whether they're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever candidate has them there, you know, they're the eyes and ears of the public. I know many folks on this call have served as poll watchers. And uh, we want to make sure that poll watchers uh, are allowed uh, to do their job. So it's a strong bill we're excited about. We did have it. You may have heard we had a filibuster in the Texas Senate uh, on Senate Bill 1. Senator Carol Alvarado from Houston uh, was one of the Democrats in the Senate who had gone to D.C. during the last special session. And she felt very strongly about the bill. And so she did a filibuster for a, a little over 12 hours. And uh, her filibuster ended. I spoke in favor of Senate Bill 1, and the Senate passed Senate Bill 1. And during the debate, during the debate, we reminded our Democratic friends, uh, read the bill. Look at what's in the bill. They want to talk about uh, other states and other countries and whatever Washington, D.C. puts out there. But this bill is common sense reforms make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. And so uh, we're very encouraged in a bill one uh, passed by the, on a party line vote by a wide margin. And we're encouraged. We know our friends over in the house are, are getting closer to having a quorum and they're, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear from them, but they're, they're taking steps, every step available to them uh, to get the democratics Democrats back. And the good news is you'll hear from them. Those voters, those voters back home are not happy with state reps, are not showing up for work. And so we, we think the voters, the voters are going to have a say in this as they should. So we're encouraged. We're blessed to be in Texas and uh, we will have a quorum at some point. We think sooner rather than later. And when we do, looking forward to that bill being passed. I'm working with Representative Murr, Chairman Andy Murr over in the House, a very sharp lawyer, uh, committee chairman, knows the law very well, excellent member of the legislature. And we're working together on the election bills to keep the House and Senate bills close together so we can avoid, uh, you know, having technical problems at the end. So overall, uh, we're in good shape. We're in good shape. What you're doing is working. Uh, the rally many of you participated in at the Capitol to counter the Beto O'Rourke rally was a big success. A lot of good media coverage out of that rally. I was honored to speak there. Some good media stories came out of that. And, I, I, and of course, we'll look forward to a rally tonight. Uh, six o'clock uh, at the Capitol, um, on the steps of the Capitol. Hope everybody can make that. I think Representative Jatan is going to be participating. I'll be there. And uh, uh, Carrie Isaac, a very sharp candidate for the Texas House, who almost won last time, an experienced campaigner, solid conservative uh, Republican woman, 
uh, is going to be there as well. So I know many of, of our friends on this call are planning on coming. So Lord willing, I'll see you there. But I will uh, I'll yield now, and, and for the next item on the agenda, happy to answer questions at some point if you'd like me to. But I'm just so proud to get to be on these calls with you, and I'm thankful for what you're doing. Thank you, Senator Hughes. We really appreciate all of your work, and uh, we, we appreciate getting the inside scoop on that. All right, moving over to the House, I believe Representative Jatan, you're on. I'm here. Great. Good, good, mor good morning, everyone. It's a good to continue to be with y'all every Friday. Um, I, I wish we had better better news on the House side still. We're, we're still waiting for the our, our mem other colleagues from the Democrat side to come back to work. Um, it's, what was it, Monday we did uh, do the call of the House. Uh, there was a temporary uh, TRO against the uh, arresting of those individuals uh, that couldn't, uh, that wouldn't show up. Uh, by Tuesday, that was lifted, and uh, we did do the, uh, uh, the instructed the sergeant at arms to work with DPS to go collect those individuals. The speaker did sign those warrants, and and so we're still hopeful that very soon we will have a quorum and we'll be able to uh, really get the hit the ground running. Um, you know, while, while the Senate's been at work and pushing things over to the House side, uh, we'll we'll be kind of teed up and ready to hit the ground running. Um, I think uh, I think it's very evident that there there are a lot of cracks on the Democrat side right now because of those that feel very safe in their districts because it's cut out a certain way, and those that are hearing from their independent voters and from their the Republican voters in their districts that are very very upset with the fact that they're not showing up at work, and uh, you you can get away with it for a little bit, but at some point. Uh, People are turning on them and they're starting to hear it more. And, um, and the more pressure that continues to be put on them, the more likely we are to get those four or five more Democrats we need to, to get back to work. And that's all we need is four or five. They're, we're, we're not far off. So, um, but no, I, I think uh, Chairman Murr and uh, Senator Hughes have done a great job with this bill and continue to um, get the right message out there about what's actually in this bill. And as long as we keep the message uh, disciplined and on track and we continue to, of course, we're going. I feel like we're going to get this done pretty soon. And it was great to have the Supreme Court back up uh, the house. Yes. Yes, it was, you know, it, it's, 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 it's chaotic what's happening this week. You know, even with the governor's orders with the uh, um, GA38 and the uh, mass mandates and counties, my, my county went and, um, they, they did a temporary TRO against the that executive order, and I suspect this, you know, that, that'll get uh, th those lawsuits will go into, and we'll get those pulled back too. And uh, it's it's unfortunate what's happening with the uh, Democrat side right now. I think there's an orchestrated effort to cause a lot of chaos, and um, and I think I think is it impacting people, you know, even parents and children now, and they're, I think people are getting fed up with it. You can only you can only push us around for so long. It's a very good point. Very good point. Well, thank y'all so much for, I know y'all have to be there every day, right? We, we, we had to get permission slips to leave. And so, you know, I, I did get a permission slip to head back home yesterday. I had a, a, a widow of a law enforcement officer that passed away last year in line of duty. And so I went back home yesterday for that. And I'm back here to, well, I was actually, that was Wednesday. So I was here yesterday and here today and be here over the weekend and We'll keep on, uh, we'll keep showing up for work and hopefully they will, you know, four or five of them more. We don't need all of them. Four or five more show up and we'll get back to work. Well, we really appreciate you and um, all the, the representatives that are there and all the senators that are there, because I think that is, that is such an additional burden for our Republican senators, our Republican um, House members that, they're having to endure this and, you know, they're having to be there. It is a huge uh, burden that's been put on them and we shouldn't lose sight of that. So thank y'all. Thank y'all very much for being there and continuing to uh, push towards getting this election integrity, which is, you know, it's easier to vote and it's harder to cheat, but um, we need to make sure that our elections are, are secure in Texas. Thank y'all. That's right. Donna Davidson, are you out there? I have, we've got such a long list. I haven't been able to. Yes, I am. I'm here. 
All right, Donna. Uh, for everyone, Donna Davidson is an elections uh, expert. She's an attorney and um, she's here. She's going to give us some insight on the procedure and what's going on. Take it away, well, Donna. Um, actually, I told Tony Ann, hey, if, um, if JC Jaton and if Brian Hughes can't be there, I'll service filler. So what I wanted to do, uh, since they gave such a wonderful overview of what's been going on, um, I have been watching the chat boxes over the last few meetings, and I'm going to just address procedurally how this is all working. If you recall, the last time I spoke with y'all, I kind of walked through the conference committee report process, um, and, and of course, we all saw what happened when it didn't pass during the regular session. Some people had questions about filibustering. Some people had questions about why our Texas Rangers aren't going to DC to go and arrest people. Some people had questions about, you know, does uh, the house have authority to do certain things under certain circumstances or, you know, what can we do? So I'm here to provide a little bit of a legal perspective on it. I'm not gonna tell you my personal opinion at this point. I just want you to hear what the law says or what the rules provide. And then that way, you, following the rule of law, will understand why the governor cannot declare a vacancy because he has no authority to. And again, as we appreciate the rule of law, we would not want him to go outside what he can and cannot do. So let me kind of step back. Um, after the end of the regular session, obviously the governor has the authority to call a special session. Special sessions are only for 30 day period of time. He can call as many as he needs to. Again, he can call as many as he needs to, but they cannot go more than 30 days at a time. The Democrats have to end up coming home at some point in time. The governor has made it clear that he has his priorities. As uh, Senator Hughes made sure to talk about, um, the Senate is getting work done. They are addressing issues that are on the call and special sessions can only address that which is on the call issued by the governor. So that is the control that the governor has. Some of the questions that I had seen over the last few weeks were, why didn't the governor declare a vacancy? I happened to research uh, this issue pretty extensively. I looked at the provisions in the Texas constitution uh, regarding qualifications, terms of office. Uh, there are no attendance requirements provided in the Texas constitution. I also looked up impeachment uh, constitutional provisions is this the basis for impeachment? I did not see anything that uh, indicated that any kind of attendance requirements or failure to appear were a basis for impeachment. I looked at the Texas government code. I looked at the Texas penal code. I took a look at every single statutory reference I thought might be able to apply to the situation. And there was nothing short of them committing some sort of a felony and then possibly being adjudicated, found guilty, and then disqualified from being able to serve that would uh, enable a vacancy to be declared at this point in time under the current laws. Again, Texas constitution, Texas statutes, I did try to do as extensive uh, research as I could. It was on my own time, so I can't say I turned over every stone, but I really did try because I was trying to be creative and trying to figure out how can we get them back. I didn't find any basis in the law for anything like that. So the governor, you know, in doing what he's done um, and the speaker in doing what the speaker has done have actually extended their... Uh, authority as far as is um, interpreted. Now, there's something I need to tell you that's a general rule of law, okay, uh, in administrative law. And when you're dealing with the government, it's an area that's referred to as administrative law. When you're interpreting rules, regulations, statutes, things along those lines as apply to government entities. So a basic 
rule or understanding is that if you are a created entity, you can only do that which you are specifically allowed to do. Let me say that again. If you're a created entity, like an officer who has certain powers, if you are not given a power, you don't automatically have that power to do something else. So I use this as an example. Let's say you as an individual want to dig a well in your backyard. If the law doesn't say you can't, you probably can't because you're an individual. You're not created by law. You are an individual. You have rights and freedoms under the law. However, if you are an entity that is created by a law, let's say a municipal utility district, and you are only allowed to dig certain wells in certain ways in certain places, then you can only dig a well in certain ways in certain places. Okay. So if something is silent as to what someone can do, for example, can the governor declare a vacancy, if it doesn't say he can, he can't. That is the basic premise in administrative law. And I wanted to make sure to make that clear. There are people who would argue, and obviously lawyers are very good at arguing all sides of a, of a subject. And you can argue, yes, that might apply. No, that might not apply. Well, it seems like under common law or common sense, you should be able to do X, Y, or Z. Those are arguments that are for the court. And obviously, you know, the court was persuaded when it had a Democrat judge to issue, you know, restraining orders, et cetera, et cetera. And then when it went to the Texas Supreme Court, they said, no, uh, the legislative branch has authority to govern itself at this time, but we'll listen to what you have to say. And you can file something, I believe the date for filing in Correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Jaton, if you know something that I don't, but I think they're supposed to respond on Monday with more information uh, before the Texas Supreme Court, because I think it was a mandamus action, not necessarily a temporary restraining order. I have not gotten to see the case itself, so I apologize for not being prepared for that. But in a nutshell, that's where we are on that side. Um, and then I know Karen will probably put me on the hot seat later and I'll let her do that, you know, when we get there. But now let me go to the filibuster uh, issue on the Senate side. Filibusters are generally most effective if you're getting close to the end of the session. If you do it in the middle of the session, it doesn't do much of good at all. So Carol Alvarado spent 15 hours standing, now remember, you can't lean against the desk, not eating and not taking a bathroom break. 15 hours later, or however many hours later, as represent, uh, Senator Hughes told us, you know, he got to put out the bill and it passed 18 to 11. Okay, so what is the difference? Does anybody remember when Wendy Davis did the filibuster? She did a 13 hour filibuster, but she did it right at the end of the special session. So she killed the bill because it couldn't be heard. There was immediately another special session called, you know, within days, if not hours, and the bill passed and that had to do with abortion. So it really depends on timing. Uh, the record, if anybody's interested for the longest filibuster in Texas, uh, is held by a now Republican. He was then a Democrat. He's now a judge, but he was a state senator at the time. And it was for 43 hours. So if you really want to be impressed, think about that in 1977. However, he used what he called an astronaut bag to be able to <clears throat> stand without a bathroom break. And apparently... Then Lieutenant Governor Hobby allowed for messages to be received from the House so that he can go and empty his bag and then come back out and it didn't count against his filibuster. So again, you know, it just depends on what's going on. And I think Lieutenant Governor Hobby was the one that got him to, to end it finally after 43 hours. Um, 
So filibustering is something that is a traditional Senate option. It's not an option in the Texas House. Uh, that is something that you need to be aware of. Um, I'd love, is Senator He's still on? Yes, I am. Okay, Senator He's, I would love for you to, to distinguish chubbing for people because I know you've seen people chub before and um, I would love for you if you could tell a story or two and I know I'm putting you on the spot because I didn't ask um, in advance and I didn't text you just a minute ago but would you tell people what the difference is between what what chubbing is I want them to understand because this could start happening soon and I just wanted to make sure that we address that in this call. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. So over in the House, unlike the Senate, members are limited in the amount of time. Same with the U.S. House. Uh, in the Texas House, and Representative Jatan and Councilor, you can correct me. Generally speaking, uh, you have 10 minutes per speaker on a given matter, right? In the House, each member can speak up to 10 minutes. And so chubbing, again, over in the Texas House, chubbing is when uh, a number of members will line up and they will each take their 10 minutes and they'll just talk about random stuff or ask questions. And so uh, it's like a number of members participating together to do a filibuster because uh, Representative X can speak for 10 minutes, then Representative Y comes up and Representative Z and they, and sometimes they'll ask each other questions. But again, uh, that's chubbing. I checked with the Legislative Reference Library. That's the people in charge of keeping the records of what happens and why it happens. And no one knows exactly where that term chubbing came from. You may know, uh, Donna, but no one that I talked to could find it. But that happens over in the House. Now, uh, that can be stopped if the speaker, if someone can move the previous question. If the speaker will recognize you to move the previous question, that's how ultimately chubbing can be stopped because after one member goes through his 10 minutes before the next member is recognized to come up and burn his 10 minutes, the speaker can recognize someone to move the previous question. Uh, sometimes people call it calling the question or various things, but the term is move the previous question. And that brings up, if, uh, that's a non, that's that motion you debate for a few minutes, you take a vote and if that motion prevails, the next issue up is on passage of the bill. And so, uh, but you're right, that's chubbing. But over in the Senate, as you say, we have the filibuster. There's no time limit on each member speaking. So as you say, as long as one member who has the floor, as long as they talk, and as you said, they cannot uh, lean on their desk, no bathroom breaks normally. You also cannot have anything to drink. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, astronaut bag in, uh, since that time. Uh, senators who filibustered had themselves, uh, pardon me, had themselves catheterized so that they could go longer and not have to worry about taking a bathroom break. And so, uh, uh, but that's the difference. You're right. Filibuster. A filibuster is one member talking and chubbing is multiple members stacking up together one after the other. They do that over in the House. Thank, Thank you, you, Donna. Thank you, Senator. And, uh, Karen, I think we'll go to you. I think there's a lot of questions out there. Oh, yes. All right, All right. let's get the, we're, we're on the hot seat. <laughs> Par for the course. And a lot of them, uh, I'm trying to group them by topic so we don't jump around. The first uh, then is from Leonard Foster. What are some good points to make when calling our AWOL Democrat representative? How about J uh, Representative Jaton might address that? Sure. No, I, I think it's it, it's it's exactly pointing out what they're doing. Um, you know, they're they're elected to be in Austin. That's where they're elected to serve, not not in D.C. or anywhere else. Um, and and I think it's important for you for them to uh, urge their call or urge their representative to get back to the Capitol. Um, most of them are still collecting their per diem that they get specifically for the special session, and. Uh, and, and, you know, one of, one of the things that uh, is kind of overlooked a lot right now is, you know, there, there's this there's this argument that breaking quorum was a procedural move, which I, I just I just disagree with. There's a there's a there's there's procedures in the rules for what happens if there is quorum broken. But I don't think it's a tool that's supposed to be used that way. But it's also a tool to uh, um, to do a call of the house and to uh, issue the warrants. And so 
Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, I, I think it's worthwhile to mention uh, that it's, it's not great representation and does not look uh, good for them to have warrants for their arrest uh, to, uh, to show up for work. So. All right. Carolyn Besselman asks, how many Democrats have returned and have the others been arrested yet? So we're, we're still, and I think the last number was 96. I, I've heard some say 95. So we're, we're four or five short. Um, warrants have been issued. Uh, it, it, as far as what, uh, whether they're going and knocking on doors and uh, handcuffing them and bringing them in, uh, we have not seen that happen yet. But uh, um, I can tell you that every every necessary or every tool that we feel that we're able to do, and I say we, the, the governor, the uh, the uh, speaker, and the and that team, um, they're they're doing it right now, and so uh, we're, we're exercising all the tools we have available. And that leads into the next question. Thomas McCaig asks, what happens if DPS shows up at a Democrat representative's house to escort them in, but that person simply refuses to come? That's, that's a good question. That, that's a little bit of the fear, right? How, what, to what extent uh, are we wanting or do we, do we want to allow DPS to go to to bring them in? Is, you know, do they, you know, are they, are we talking about tackling them and handcuffing them and dragging them down there and um, you know, what if, what if they, what if they decide to use self-defense? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, there, there are concerns that are worthwhile. I mean, they, they, we need, we need to make sure we're good with all the possible scenarios. And I think that's a lot of what's being explored right now, but the warrants have been issued and, um, all, all we need is four or five to comply with the warrants and the, the call of the house and, uh, and what they were elected to do. And can we have a list of the Democrats and their contact info so we can call them ourselves? I don't know if anyone has that. Yes. I don't think I've seen a recent list. I think we've uh, got tired of uh, putting together a list, but we can, we can put together a list. Um, I can see if I can help with that. And what is the PR plan to hammer the Democrats for obstructing and destroying democracy by abdicating the will of all Texas voters by their absence, James Brandon asks. What is the PR plan? Well, I, I think, you know, as far as the House Republican Caucus goes, we, we pushed out a lot and we've been pretty disciplined on the message. Uh, and this is why a lot of independents are um, getting very upset. You, you have the 13th check for retired teachers. You have the children in foster care, the, the necessary funding uh, to take care of those children. Um, there's a lot of other things on this legislative uh a special session that aren't being aren't being addressed because of their absence. And uh, as much as they want to keep on pointing at this election bill and making false claims about it, people people realize there's other important things that uh, should be getting addressed that aren't. And that's something that we've continued to push out there. And I think over you know in, until 2022, uh, that that's going to continue to be the message that there was this massive disruption that caused a, a lot of chaos, a lot of wasted money, and um, and I think there's going to be consequences. There were consequences in the past when they pulled this uh, stunt and um, this, this, none of them lasted this long or had this much of an impact in my opinion. And, and so I, I think that we're going to continue to pounce on this. And I, I, I think there's going to be kind of a united front among the Republicans on this. All right. Linda Dernan asks, will Speaker Phelan remove any more Democrats from being the heads of committees? So there, there's some debate about whether or not the speaker can do that on his own. Um, I think we've come to the conclusion that he can't. But once there is a quorum, the body will have the ability to uh, put in motion those type of things. And uh, I think it's our full intention at this point. You know, any any desire, any ability to work with uh, the Democrats on um, compromises or anything else, uh, they, they, they've blown all that up. They, they have absolutely brought D.C. politics to Austin. And uh, as much as I hate that, uh, we're, we're there now. And so I think there's a stomach for uh, um, drawing those lines in the sand. All right, the next questions are for Senator Hughes. Uh, did you include in SB1 the provision on section 31.005, which was recommended in the hearing, which would allow the Secretary of State to act if there is a violation of the Texas election code, not only if there is a violation of voting rights? Uh, so in Senate Bill 1, uh, we made a lot of those changes. Let me just say in general, we have a balance because I think we, we recognize that when 
uh, we have a rogue election officer. We want to make sure they're following the law. We also we also like the fact that in Texas we have a decentralized system, and we have counties given a certain amount of discretion. And so we don't want to put so much power in the Secretary of State. <clears throat> the Secretary of State will not always be someone we like. It may not always be someone appointed by a Republican governor. And so we did put penalties in place for election officers. They can uh, be held accountable. They can be brought in front of a judge. They can even lose their pensions if they refuse to follow the law. So that's how we address that. And it appears that a forensic audit in 2020 is not in SB1. Uh, Senator Hughes, can you please confirm or otherwise? Paul Yammerick asks. That's right. We did pass in the regular session, Senator Lois's, Senator Lois Cold Course bill, which we've been trying to pass for years. I filed them, many members have filed them, to require a paper backup, auditable paper trail, and to require audits. And so we're going to have audits going forward, but there's nothing in the bill that looks for an audit looking backwards. We will have audits going forward. All right. And this question is for Representative Jatan. Will you co-author HB 26, the forensic audit of the 2020 election? As of, as of right now. Yeah, no, they, there's, you know, and I've, I've been watching the um, forensic audit bill. I, I think there were some changes made from the prior special session to that bill. Um, I, I'm a little concerned still about the inconsistency in the procedures and machines used in all 254 counties and how you end up with a forensic audit that doesn't raise more questions and concerns um, and, and, and without the ability to actually confirm um, you know, fraudulent votes. And so like, like, like Senator Hughes mentioned, we, we did pass in Bill 598. It does create a, uh, require a paper ballot backup uh, for all 254 counties, which allows for a forensic audit in the future that would be consistent that you could find abnormalities and fraud. But I'm a little concerned about what, what this ends up looking like if we spend a lot of time and resources uh, trying to do a forensic audit when there's no, there's no you know, real baseline. This is, this is one of the reasons we're having to do SB1 and HB3 is to put more consistencies across the state. And so that, that's, that's my current stance on it. And I'm continuing to explore it. And, uh, I'm sure there's some strong opinions on why I should support it, and I, I'm always willing to listen. All right. Fred Reitman asks, what specific provisions do Democrats claim represent Jim Crow or otherwise discriminate against some voters? And then what can we point to in the bill to refute mm -hmm. those claims, S Senator Hughes? It's a great question. Uh, they talk a lot about poll watchers. And they say that we are allowing partisan poll watchers to run amok and to intimidate voters and to uh, interfere in the voting process. That claim is simply false. And here's what we say in response. If you look at the law today on poll watchers, this is current law without Senate Bill 1. Current law says poll watchers are allowed to observe any activity in the polling place, any activity other than the voter casting the ballot. You can't look and see how the voter is voting. Anything else a poll watcher is currently allowed to observe. Current law says they are allowed to sit or stand conveniently close to observe the activity. And current law says if an election official or election worker prevents a poll watcher from doing this, it's a crime. It's a class A misdemeanor. That's already the law. That's the law on poll watchers. The changes we're making in Senate Bill 1 say this. Instead of allowing them to stand uh, conveniently near, uh, no one really knows what that means. So we're making it clear they can stand or sit near enough to see and observe the activity. And it also says, now, if there's a poll watcher who has their credentials, the election worker must let them in to the polling place and allow them to do their job. So. They're making it sound like we are making big changes on poll watchers. We put a couple of changes in place to make sure poll watchers can do their jobs. We are not increasing their power. And for the first time, we're providing a training for poll watchers to be offered. And has to, this materials have to be given to every poll watcher. So that's one thing. They talk about poll watchers. They also say 
<clears throat> part of it, they also say that we are uh, somehow discriminating by doing voter ID, which is crazy. They, they don't like voter ID for mail ballots. They don't like voter ID for in-person voting. But so when they claim that voter ID for mail ballots is going to make it harder for people, we just remind them that back 10 years ago, when we passed in-person voter ID, they told us the same thing. They said, you're going to turn down voters. You're going to depress turnout, discourage people, discriminate. But what happened? We passed voter ID, a simple common sense reform, and voting increased across the state, across parties. Uh, it, it, it made more people want to vote because they knew their vote was going to count. So they're complaining a lot about poll watchers, and there's no basis for that. They're complaining about voter ID, and history has proven them wrong. They are ignoring the fact that we're making it easier for working people to vote because now during early voting, your employer has to let you off work to vote if your schedule doesn't allow it. And now if you're in line to vote during early voting and the polls close, they must let you vote. And now for the first time ever, there will be a process to cure, to fix technical problems with your ballot by mail. Right now, there's no way to do that. So, uh, Again, their charges are that we're empowering partisan poll watchers. That is false. Their charges are that voter ID for mail ballots is going to decrease, decrease people voting by mail. That is false. They claim this bill makes it harder to vote. This bill gives more opportunities to vote in person, more weekend voting, more hours of early voting. The one, the one thing this does is clarifies we don't have 24-hour voting in Texas. So, you can't vote at 2.30 a.m. Yep, you got me there. You can't vote at 2.30 in the morning. But we're giving you more chances to vote during the day, during the evening, on the weekends. Employer has to let you off to vote if your schedule conflicts. Uh, so, so honestly, they don't have much to talk about. All they can do is generalize. But if they try to get into specifics, they have to admit these are common sense reforms in this bill. All right. Uh, from James Brandon asks, the, the county election staff who train volunteer workers typically play down, diminish, or don't stress the importance of poll watchers' role in the process. How can the training by election administrators for election judges be uniformly improved to change this? Well, that's a great question. We do have in Senate Bill 1 uh, training materials that are provided by the, by the Secretary of State's office. And we're going to have input uh, in what those materials say. And those materials, those training materials, will have to be given. They'll be required uh, material given to every poll watcher. So that should help. All right. Charles Simmons says, you will not see what you do not look for. Have Representative Jaton and Senator Hughes examined Lindell, Frank, and Keschel's evidence? I've, I've seen it. some of it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll let you go first, Professor Your time. Sure. No, I, I, I've looked at it and uh, done my research on it, and um, I, I, I find flaws with some or most of it, and you know. But I think what's there that we can take seriously, we we have. And so when we looked at the the machines, I, I think that during the regular session we passed some bills that um, address some of those concerns about the um, manufacturing of the machines and. Uh, uh, and we've, we've, I think we've addressed what we can out of those bills, and, I, and a lot of it's getting addressed in SB one and HB three, and um, we'll, we'll continue. I'll continue to look at whatever evidence is out there. Um, we're just, I'll let you go from there, so you use. Well, that's exactly right. And in Senate Bill one, and during the regular session, as Representative Jatan said, uh, we put some specific things in place. For example, one of the concerns was the the uh, votes being changed. The code being changed after the votes are recorded, uh, the code, the votes being changed. And there were some some experts said that by looking at the code, they could tell that votes had been changed. Other experts, unbiased experts, said that's not what happened. So here's what we did. Law will require now going forward that the disks, the recording, the recording media, the, the disks that they record those votes on will have to be what are called right once disks discs that it is physically impossible to record over. You can use them one time, you record those votes, 
and they're locked. You can't change them. You can't put anything else on them. So we put that in place. We also require a keystroke, keystroke uh, software on these voting machines, on the tabulation equipment. So we'll be able to tell if someone got on the keyboard and messed with the, with the results after the fact. That's in Senate Bill 1. Uh, and of course, as Representative Jatan said, during the regular session, we passed some security measures for the machines. So yes, and uh, we, we looked at everything. We've been seeing the Attorney General's office. We looked at everything available to us. The Attorney General's office has looked at vast numbers of vast amounts of materials. And what we took away from that is the changes that we made uh, in Senate Bill 1 and during the regular session. Thank you all. Thank you for being on the hot seat this morning. And uh, thank you for all the information that y'all have given us. We really appreciate what y'all are doing. Um, we have for our call to action today, uh, Quentin Hitchcock has got, uh, he's got the floor. Talk to us, Quentin. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I know this is last minute, but wanted to go ahead and give you an update on what the RNC is doing. So much like two weeks ago, uh, we are organizing a rally, and this is a very last minute rally uh, that's going to be tonight at 6 p.m. on the front steps of the Capitol. Uh, and folks, I, I do want to first and foremost say that when I say this is last minute, uh, this is something that I did not even know about uh, 72 hours ago. So uh, like everything else that we do, and, and we will continue to do this cycle you know, it is last minute for that, I do apologize. But for those of you who are gonna be near Travis County, um, we would love for you to come out. All we are asking is for 45 minutes of your time. Uh, we are gonna be meeting at 5.30 at the RPT headquarter office in downtown Austin and walking over a couple blocks to the Capitol. Uh, we are very, very grateful to have Senator Hughes and Representative Jatan joining us. We have a communications team that is working very hard to get press and media there to cover our side of this issue. And folks, um, and I can't make this any more clear, the more of us that are out there, the more excitement we can generate, um, you know, the, the better the better we are serving this cause. And uh, this is a big deal, not just in Texas, but across the country. And to give you guys some context, you know, there's a lot of states in the country that are very sensitive to election integrity. States like Arizona, states like Pennsylvania and Georgia. Folks, I just wanna encourage everyone by saying, you know, calls like this at seven o'clock in the morning, rallies that we're doing on not just a monthly basis or a bi-weekly basis, but a weekly basis. Folks, things like that are not happening anywhere else, um, at least not to the extent that they are here. So uh, really, really pleased that everybody has been so supportive of our team as we're doing this and, uh, and these calls as well. We, we hope to see everybody out there. Um, and with that being said, thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to having a great event tonight. Hey, Quentin, where, where is the RNC office? Can you give everybody the address and where they should be? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and type it right now. But in case you guys have a pen in your hand, it is 807 Brazo Street. You'll have to forgive me. The zip code is um, away from me right now. Um, in Austin. So go ahead and uh, meet us there at 530. Um, I'm going to also include my cell phone number really quick. And if anybody has questions whatsoever um, about anything, whether it's related to this or not, uh, please feel free to give me a call, a text anytime. Um, uh, my job is to be helpful with this and be accommodating. So please use me as a resource. Thanks, Quentin. And, and y'all are highlighting Senate Bill 1 and uh, getting it passed and getting the Democrats back, right? Yes, ma'am. We're excited. That's great. So anyone that can uh, participate, that'd be great. If you know somebody in Austin that might be able to go and uh, be part of the group that's, uh, that hopefully the media picks up. Uh, I think Quentin puts a good point out there. The more pictures that are, are going around, even if it's just on social media, you know, there is there is some power behind all that. Um, we're, we've gone a little over our 745 that we said we would do this morning. Um, I want it, it, to it remind everybody, as Tony Ann uh, said, they're welcoming prayers for Tom and uh, his medical conditions. So, uh, 
if y'all would pray for her, that'd be great. And really appreciate everybody coming on and keeping and working at this. We will get this passed. You know, I think the governor's determined. Uh, Senator Hughes and the Senate's determined. Uh, uh, Representative Jatan and the speaker and everyone, they're determined to get this election integrity bill through. And so uh, everybody keep pushing. We're going to beat them. <laughs> it's just going to take yeah. some determination. And one of the talking points that I've used with people is, uh, especially in Texas, it's like, you know, having a championship game and the other team decides we're not going to show up and play because we know we're going to lose. So, you know, <laughs> let's, let, let's, let's get them out there. Uh, thank y'all so much. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, before before you dismiss, uh, this is Dennis Armstrong. I, and Quentin, I think, was on the line. If he was, uh, for those of us that are on audio only, would he give us his cell phone number before we adjourn? Yes, sir. Uh, let me know when you guys are ready. We're ready. <laughs> Perfect. 702-525-8258. Thank you very and much. Folks, Folks, I get no fewer than 500 phone calls a day, so I am encouraging you to make it 600. Please call me. Um, again, I want to be helpful with not just, it, not just this, but everything else. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's get out there and be the story. Yes, Bisa, yes, go ahead, Charlie. Be, be, before we, we leave, just want to thank you for not allowing us to skip a beat. These calls are very important. Uh, while we miss Tony Ann, we wish her well, her and Tom very well. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, keeping us together, link, keeping us linked. And uh, to all of our, our speakers this morning, thank you so much for coming on board with us in spite of or in addition to all of the, the stressful things you have to make this, these laws pass for us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye now. And yeah, Bisa, yeah. you know what? I want to volunteer. If everybody needs to leave and you adjourn us, if anybody wants to stay on for just a minute, I would be happy to lead us in prayer for Tom. Okay. All right. We'll we'll uh, we'll let whoever wants to get off before we say a prayer. Okay. All right. Go for Donna. it, Donna. Go ahead. Go, Donna. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you that we can come before your throne of grace and that we can ask and and we can ask in your will that something be done. And Lord, we ask you to be with Tony Ann and Tom. Please weep with Tom and his health issues. Give him the strength to persevere through this. Give his doctors wisdom and discernment as to how best to treat Tom. And Father, we ask for the peace that passes all understanding to be in Tony Ann's heart for I know she trusts in you. We know she loves you. And we are just so grateful that we can come before your throne and know that you care about even the number of hairs on our heads. So when it becomes something this um, serious, we know how much you care for us. But our prayer is that in your strong and loving arms, that you carry Tony, Ann, and Tom through this uh, medical situation and that you wrap them, envelop them, and give them strength to trust in you. And Lord, we ask that it be your will that, that Tom be healed. And uh, Lord, we just pray that your will be done. And we trust in you. For it is in Jesus' most holy name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. Amen. Be blessed, y'all. See you guys next week. Or Thank or tonight you. at the rally, I hope. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Thank y'all. Bye. 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 Bye.